Hello, Alex here with part two of my collaboration with Lomography UK. Today we're going to ask and answer the question, can you do medium format macro photography without a macro lens for your medium format camera? Let's get into it. So in this video, I am going to assume some prior knowledge with regards to technical terminology like what macro photography is, reproduction ratio, extension tubes, close-up filters, all these kind of technical things that tie into macro photography. I'm not going to go into them in this video because I did that in part one, which you can view up here. Or if you happen to know this stuff already, perfect. So why bother? Why go through all this effort? Macro photography is fun. I really enjoy it. It's what I grew up doing, photographically speaking. But for a lot of medium format cameras, a macro lens is either hard to get and thus extremely expensive, or it doesn't exist. There are some systems that just don't have a macro lens. So in those cases, it can be nice to go beyond the native close focusing capabilities of your lenses to see just how far you can push it and how close you can get to your subject. Now, I did mention in part one why this isn't really a good idea. I mean, it's very, very hard to get macro images of the same uh, relative proportion on medium format than it is on 35 millimeter APS-C micro four thirds, any other smaller format. And the short version is that the magnification or reproduction ratio has nothing to do with the size of your film. So a 1x reproduction ratio will have the subject appear much larger, relatively speaking, in a full frame image than a 6x9 image. That's just the way it is. But that doesn't mean we're not going to try. Macro photography is really fun and I thought I would be the one to go and actually test all this stuff. So I'm going to give a very, very quick rundown of the different ways that we're going to be testing to increase our magnification ratio. One, extension tubes. They're hollow, they sit between your camera and your lens, you lose infinity focus, but they don't significantly affect the image quality in principle because there's no glass inside them. Two, diopter filters or close-up filters. I prefer calling them diopter filters because, you know, diopters, glasses. They are like a spectacle that sits on the front of your lens. They are specific to the filter thread of your lens. They give you generally a much broader range of focus than an extension tube will, but because you're adding glass in front of the lens, you're reducing your optical quality. And again, you don't get infinity focus. Number three, the reversal ring. Reversal rings are kind of a strange one. They either do or don't work for macro photography at all, depending on what your lens is. And we'll see that later on. But the general idea is that you're just putting the lens backwards in front of the camera. So if it's a wide angle lens in particular, it takes a very wide scene and compresses it into your film or sensor normally. When you reverse it, it takes a very small area, like a flower or something, and projects it really, really large over the film or sensor. So you get potentially get a very high magnification that way. So I'm going to be using two lenses for this setup. First, the Pentax 105mm f2.4, the archetypal beautiful fast portrait lens for the Pentax 6.7 system. It is an incredible lens. It has extremely high optical quality, but a terrible minimum focusing distance of one meter. Now that doesn't sound too bad for a 105 millimeter lens, but when you consider that it's a 50 mil equivalent, a lot of 50 mil lenses have minimum focus distances from like 30 to 45 centimeters. So two to three times shorter. So that's terrible. I also own the Pentax 135 F4 macro lens. Now this is not a true one-to-one -one macro lens. It only goes down to one is to 3.2, but it's still significantly closer than the 105 F2.4. So what I've done is carry out a series of tests using the Pentax 6.7, both of these lenses, and extension tubes, reversal rings, and diopter filters of various lengths and strengths to actually test out how these two lenses compare. I did it with both lenses because they share the 67 millimeter filter thread for the diopter filters, but also as the 135 is not a one-to-one -one macro lens, it also benefits from these accessories. For example, if you stack the number one, two, and three extension tubes for a ridiculous 98 millimeters of extension, that brings you to one-to-one -to -one with the 135 millimeter lens. That's a lot. So I wanted to see if either one can really give 
good quality images at one to one or one to two, you know, half life size even, because I don't necessarily need true macro on medium format. I have my Canon macro lens for that, but it would still be significantly better than the one meter focus distance of the 105 or the one to 3.2 reproduction of the macro lens. And then the results of this test will determine whether or not I sell the 135 macro lens. If the 105 with the accessories can do a similar or good enough job, I don't need both. Operationally speaking, all of these images were shot at f16. I took meter readings with my Sekonic light meter and I did accidentally overexpose and you can see some blown out highlights in the images. To be honest, the film still coped really well in spite of that because even given the fact that the light source was so incredibly close. Again, that's just a limitation of what I was working with at the time. We had some construction going on. I couldn't set up my flashes or anything. All in all, with the crappy lighting setup, the film held up extremely well, in my opinion. I took some images on Fuji Pro 400H just before I started this because I had some film left in the Pentax 6.7 before I loaded it up for this test. And you see the exact same kind of thing. So. If it's holding up as well as Fuji Pro 400H, that's a win in my book. One last thing before we get into the actual results. This video was made in collaboration with Lomography UK, who kindly sponsored this video by providing me with a three pack of Lomography's color negative 400 film, which I used for this testing. I used this film to take 25 test images across a range of diopter, extension tube and lens and reversal ring combinations and then a few bonus images just to round out the third roll. I sincerely appreciate their contribution to this project and the results, turns out, are pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> I'll talk a bit more about Lomography and what they do at the end, but for now, let's get into the actual results. So let's just look at the highlights first and then look at some comparisons. This is the 105mm f2.4 with the plus 10 diopter. Sharpness, contrast have absolutely completely fallen apart. This is the 135 with the plus 4 diopter. And while the resolution remains pretty okay, it's not very good. And there's a huge amount of chromatic aberration here. Additionally, the sharpness falls off very sharply at the corner with a sort of radial smearing. The 105mm performed very poorly with all three extension tubes attached. And the 135 performed quite poorly, but less so. There is less sharpness in this compared to the equivalent 105 image, but the contrast is much more salvageable. The 105mm with the plus two diopter for just over one is to three reproduction gives excellent sharpness with only a minimal loss of contrast and a very small amount of chromatic aberration which is only visible in the most high contrast areas. The 135 also sees a drop in contrast with the plus two, which is how I've been using this lens previously, but the sharpness remains very, very good with the plus two filter. And the effect in increasing chromatic aberration is there, but tolerable. So for our first comparison on the left, we have the 105 millimeter lens with the plus two diopter and on the right, we have the 135 with no diopter. These have 0.36 and 0.31x magnifications respectively. So it's similar, but there is a slight advantage on the side of the 105 here. You can see clearly that the 105 with the diopter does have lower contrast. The black point is quite worse. And when we zoom in, the 135 has a significant sharpness advantage. For the second comparison, we have the 105 with the plus four diopter on the left and the 135 with the plus two on the right. Here we both have about 0.4x or slightly below half life size magnification with a slight edge on the side of the 135. You can clearly see that both of them have fairly reduced contrast, especially the 135, which I didn't expect, but given that the 105 is using the much stronger diopter here. As expected, it's pretty clearly visible here that the 105 loses out in terms of resolution just because it's not as optimized for close focusing distances and we're making it worse by adding a cheap glass element in front of it. In terms of chromatic aberration here, however, despite using the much weaker diopter filter, the 135 exhibits quite a lot more chromatic aberration. And, and that's just something the 105 is known for suppressing very well, regardless of external accessories. So that kind of makes sense. 
So the framing is quite different here just because I had difficulties focusing. On the left, we have the 105 with all three extension tubes stacked with the lens set to its minimum focusing distance. On the right, we have the 135 again with all three extension tubes stacked and again at its own minimum focusing distance. Both of these are pretty much exactly one is to one life size. And this shows just how much less effective extension tubes are with a longer focal length lens, even if that lens has a significantly shorter minimum focusing distance to begin with. The difference is pretty obvious here. The 105 loses entirely. The 135 retains very respectable contrast. Resolution is very poor on the 105 side. I did focus slightly further back, not on purpose in this case with the 135. Sharpness is still very, very good there in the center. Off center, we see the exact same thing. There's a lot of detail still there in the 135. The 105, not at all. Again, the 135 wins in this case. The last highlight is the free lens, that is to say hand reversed without the reversal ring, 45mm f4 as the sort of MVP to round this comparison out. This I did not expect to go well at all because the other lens is performed very poorly. But although the depth of field is extremely shallow, it is extremely sharp within that very narrow plane of focus. I'm extremely impressed with this and it brings us way beyond life size. This could be three, four, five X. I don't know. Okay, so that turned out way more cut and dry than I expected. Neither of these lenses like the extension tubes. I wouldn't honestly really be comfortable doing paid work at one-to-one -one with either. Even the 135, which pairs reasonably well with the three stacked extension tubes, it's not that great. It's okay, but it's not that great. The 105, it's obviously just not capable of resolving good quality images out the rear of itself onto your film at such extreme magnifications. Extreme being, you know, greater than one is to six. It's pretty clear that I'm going to be keeping both of these for the time being. The 105 is a significantly sharper lens in normal shooting circumstances and the fast aperture is amazing. But for close-up work, the 135 cannot be beaten, it would seem. I would have no problems using this 105 with the plus one filter and I think I'm going to keep doing that. So the actual question here, can you do medium format photography without a macro lens? For this pair of lenses, the answer is absolutely not. The 105 just cannot keep up with the 135 at very close focusing distances, whether you're using extension tubes, diopter filters, or God forbid the reversing ring, you saw how bad both of them were with that. It's just, there's no competition, right? I thought the results of this were going to be much more subjective. You know, there would be some small trade-offs either way, but it's, it's really just cut and dry. I'm genuinely surprised. Before we wrap up and look at the final extra images, I want to give a quick proper shout out to Lomography. Lomography are one of those companies that's keeping film alive at the moment and helping to broaden the range of people who are exposed to it. I personally know a few people who only got into film because some local shops around Dublin that don't stock photography or film kind of products stock Lomography products. So whether that's something like the Loma Graphlock back, four x five cameras, the simple use reloadable film camera, the Diana in basically every format you can imagine, different items and masks to help with scanning, and all sorts of weird and unique films like the Lomochrome Purple and Metropolis or Lomochrome Teal. Maybe I can get my hands on a roll of that one day. Or the really low ISO Kino films or the Petsval lenses from SLR cameras. They're really doing something unique. And I know it's not for everyone. I know the idea of a reloadable, disposable style camera isn't for a lot of people, but if it's getting film into the hands of more people, then we are all directly or indirectly benefiting from them. Personally, I'm a big fan of their products and I want to pick up a copy of the Diana Instant Square relatively soon because I want to get into Instax type formats because Polaroid is crazy expensive and the Diana Instant Square is very flexible with interchangeable lenses. If you enjoyed this video and like what I do, please consider subscribing or donating to my Patreon where the tiers start at just one euro per month.
If you don't already, follow me on Instagram at shaka1277 for new pictures every single day. If you're interested in seeing the like extended cut where I go through all of the images from this review, let me know in the comments down below and I'll put that video out at a later date if people are interested. Stay safe and bye bye for now.